Good evening, folks. We are really pleased to be back with you. I'm a menopause dietitian, Nigel Denby, and I am waiting for my colleague, Dr. Zoe Shadell, to join us. Um, some of you might remember, hi Tracy Wolf. Some of you might remember that uh, we were with you um, just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, talking to you about all things uh, menopause. And um, we are thrilled to bits to be back with you. And also to be, uh, there is Zoe, is she joining? Uh, chuffed to be back with you um, and we're also going to be back for uh, the next three weeks um, doing here she is there's Zoe hello hello how are you I'm well how are you Nigel really good Thank good you. to be back yes isn't it lovely um, I was just telling everyone that we're really chuffed that um, we've been asked to come back and uh, for the next uh, including tonight for the next four weeks to really give you, I guess, a masterclass, if you like, in menopause care. Um, Dr. Zoe Shadell, uh, like Chanel, not Dr. Zoe Shiddle, like Little. Dr. <laughs> Zoe Shadell yes. is an expert in menopause. She uh, trains other GPs to help support other women with menopause. So together, I hope, that we're going to be able to really give you everything you need to know uh, about perimenopause, uh, about menopause, about whether HRT is something you want to think about. Um, Zoe also has a special interest in um, sleep issues around um, perimenopause and menopause. And of course, my big area is nutrition, uh, bone health, heart health, digestive health, and of course, that menopause spare tire, the menopause weight gain that we reckon about three quarters of women struggle with. Tonight, we're going to cover a lot of the ground that we did in our first session. And I would love to say that that's a really thought through, planned um, area that we're going to cover and nothing to do with the fact that I forgot to record it the first <laughs> time we did it. Um, and so only the, the, the folk who were watching live got to hear um, what we were saying. So we thought actually, let's do it again. Um, I'm sure there'll be other new things that we'll talk about as well tonight. Um, and then we can record it. And then in the remainder of the series, next week, we will talk to you all about HRT. The following week, we will cover menopause and sleep. And then our final session uh, will be on menopause weight gain. And these will be for the next three Thursdays at six o'clock. I think that's the housekeeping done. And mm. you've got a wet dishcloth ready in case I forget to uh, <laughs> record again. <laughs> it's I great. Can't... It just gives us another opportunity, Nigel. We can, you know, it's just... Uh... Nicely put. Nicely yeah. put, matey. Thank you. Right. So I think, you know, where we need to start with um, is, you know, really looking at just what menopause is and the difference between peri menopause and menopause because it's easy for you and I to remember forget isn't it when you know we're so immersed in this subject day in day out mm. that it still is this ludicrous scenario that s the majority of women are not informed about this mm -hmm. um, and it can often come as a complete surprise so let's really start at the beginning sure. um, and, and what it is in the first yeah. place so menopause is basically the phase of life after our periods have stopped. So you make the diagnosis of menopause one year after your last period. So you can only do it looking backwards. And that's the whole phase of life. After that time, we're in a different phase of our reproductive life. We're not going to have babies. You know, it's just a different phase. But what people are less aware of is the lead up to that point. And so in order to get to that point where the periods stop, there's been all sorts of hormonal changes happening. You could call it hormonal chaos. And that happens, um, you know, really can be five or even 10 years before the last period. 
And that time is called the perimenopause. And I think that is often the time that does cause a bit of a shock to people. People don't know what to expect. There isn't good education about it when we're younger. I don't remember learning much about it. I knew a bit about periods and having babies a little bit. Um, but I didn't know anything about the perimenopause. And yeah. it comes at a time when, you know, we're often busy in life. It's often in the 40s. That's when it happens on average for the average woman. Mm-hmm. What, and, early yeah. 40s, late 40s, where would you expect it to be? Yeah, so, you know, it's difficult to say because we don't have good studies to say. But the average age for the last period is about 50. So the okay. menopause is 51 one year later. And perimenopause is on average, about five five years before then. So mid forties is the most common time for the symptoms to start. But of course, it right. can be a bit later and a, and a bit earlier. Yeah. Um, but so many symptoms can occur due to these hormonal changes. And you know, it, I think it's so important that people know what might be happening, what might mm. be the cause for their symptoms mm. at this time. Well, let let let's look at that then. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I imagine most people might be familiar with the idea of hot flushes yeah Um, yeah but I mean there's a lot more to this than that isn't there yeah absolutely so hot flushes are something that happens when the estrogen drops to be low and and a bit to do with the variation in estrogen as well in in the lead up to the last period but actually that's not the most common thing to happen in the perimenopause, the first sort of symptoms. Much more commonly, people just notice they're becoming more anxious, losing confidence potentially. There can be lots of mood changes associated with variation in hormones. Also, energy levels can drop. Um, Sometimes there are changes, physical changes, skin and hair can change. Um, you You can get the hot flushes, night sweats, sleep can be very disturbed so Mm. sometimes the sleep's disturbed because you're having night sweats and it's quite obvious what's happening sometimes it's related to being a bit more anxious having more stress Um, but sometimes sleep just goes out of the window for no good reason and it's often a hormonal reason during the perimenopause that causes that sometimes women get joint pains sometimes people get palpitations because Oestrogen affects every single system in the body. So the number of symptoms you can get is absolutely huge. And I think it's so important to know that when things are happening in that time of life and you don't quite know what's going on, it could have a hormonal basis for it. Do these sorts of symptoms, in your experience, do they sometimes get mixed up as being caused by other things? Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose what we know a lot recently, there's been some research to say, often the mood changes in the perimenopause are mistakenly thought to be depression. And so women that might see their GP and and be more anxious or or low and struggling to cope or just suffering with lots of stress are the GPs don't necessarily think, oh, this is a time when it could be hormones and Mm. actually instead offer women antidepressants. And actually, we know that antidepressants aren't the right treatment for those well, kind not, of mood changes. Not if this is caused by hormones. I mean, yeah. antidepressants can be great at treating depression, but this yeah. isn't depression, no. is it? Exactly, exactly. And so when it's not clinical depression and when actually, you know, some women know that it's you know they feel as though there's something hormonal behind it they feel as though Mm -hmm. they're just not quite right they've lost their mojo they're not themselves um and and we know the nice guidelines all of the the research suggests that antidepressants aren't the right treatment for that you know we need to think about it from a hormonal perspective is it fair to say because i mean I've often been involved in teaching gps about nutrition and you know very often um it's quite alarming how little training there is about uh, nutrition. What about menopause? What's the situation for GPs there? Is it a big part of the of the, the sort of doctor's curriculum? No, it hasn't been up till recently. So firstly, at medical school, I can't remember it being mentioned. It just didn't right. come up. Um, and I suppose, you know, also just in general life, We don't think, you know, you don't learn at school much about, you know, when you you get taught your periods are going to start, but I don't think people mention they're going to stop at some point and what that might mean. It's just sort of ignored area. But it's at medical school, we didn't do it. Yeah. Sorry, did your mum tell you anything about menopause? 
Yeah. Do you know what? That is an interesting question. So my mum actually did. And I've often thought about this because it was a time when I just qualified as a doctor. Yeah. And as we've said, I didn't get much training on it at medical school. And my mum's menopause coincided with um, some of the scares about HRT. And I think back with quite a bit of... um, a bit of regret, actually, because mm. I remember her asking me about it and saying she was feeling pretty dreadful. Um, and she wanted to start on HRT, and she did. And I said, oh, you know, we know that that could be quite dangerous. And in fact, you know, try and do it, smallest dose, have a little tiny bit, and, um, and you know, try and stop it at some point, because, you know, it, it might be dangerous. Because there were these awful scares, which I yeah. now know was incorrect. But even more embarrassingly, my mum, for various reasons, only needed estrogen only HRT. And what I know now is that estrogen only HRT was never associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. And in fact, it reduced the risk. Now, I'm really lucky because my mum's an absolutely incredible woman who ignored me completely and (laughs) thought, there's no way I'm going to listen to her. Um, I can't survive. And and my mum actually, my mum works um, running a clinic for women that have been abused and and she's spent all her life sort of about empowering other women. And there's no way she could continue in that, you know, in her job, in her busy life having terrible sleep and you know all sorts of other symptoms so she thankfully ignored me completely and continued with HRT and very quickly I looked into it a bit more and I I gave her the right advice I'm glad to say but it was interesting that even Mm. at that point I wasn't well educated enough to advise her I'm glad she did it she did ignore me when you think about it now you know women in their mid 40s will a lot of them will be going into perimenopause at the same time as their daughters are starting their yeah. periods and and as you say you know we're really good at equipping girls for knowing what's going to happen and how mm. to deal with it uh, why on earth don't we at the same time say and you know this you will get to the other end of this and then this is what happens and there yeah. are all these choices maybe you know let's hope we get to that point but so from what i'm picking up it sounds like a lot of women maybe don't know about this a lot of GPs are not mm. necessarily going to know about this. Mm. So why do you know about it? Would you, how did you learn? So um, I, I was always actually hoping to be a, a gynecologist that throughout medical school. That was going to be my career direction. But for various reasons, I changed career uh, to become a GP. And as soon as I was a GP, I realised that I would have the opportunity to speak to women all day long in my clinic about their health and and that was just absolutely wonderful it's been a fantastic job but I've always then had a special interest in women's health the sorts of problems that women commonly experience whether it's to do with pregnancy or periods or or mood or um, metabolism but menopause came up much much more about six or seven years ago and I realized that although I was you know very well trained in women's health and I'd had extra extra training extra qualifications I wasn't as well educated as some of the women that were coming to see me and there was some and there's been lots of new research about menopause and about HRT in the last 10 years and I realized I really needed to catch up and the British Menopause Society runs a training program to allow doctors to become you know better educated you can do a basic level where you you know you do a certificate or you can do advanced training and then you can go on to become a specialist. And so I embarked on all of this and um, it's been a really amazing journey. And I'm so glad that I have because every woman is going to go through this. You know, everyone yeah. that, that's alive through their midlife is going to go through this. So now I can, you know, I've got the right information to give to people that, I, that I'm looking after. Which is, I mean, again, staggering to think, yeah, half the population are going to be affected by this. And yet, you know, just a handful of people are really, um, a handful of doctors are experts in it. I mean, are we talking about, are there thousands of menopause specialist GPs? So I think there's about 160 menopause specialists made up of gynaecologists and GPs across the country. Um, and so, you know, it is a real handful, but, yeah. but we are training more. And so I'm, I, you know, I got approved as a trainer for menopause specialists last year. And I'm, I'm already training lots of other doctors who want to develop their skills, which is absolutely fantastic. Brilliant. Well done, you. Right. OK, so. What 
so let's assume somebody yes. watching this is thinking, right, okay, it's not just hot flushes mm -hmm. and, and I'm not feeling right and I'm mm -hmm. not sleeping well and actually my mood is affected. I mean, from what you're saying, this is literally top of your head to tips of your toes. You could experience symptoms. There must be yeah. dozens of symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a... Do, do, have we got a tracker or some yeah. way of being able to identify what's going on? Or, or would you get a blood test? What happens? So it's all about symptoms for women in their 40s, usually. So you don't need a blood test to diagnose the menopause in your 40s. But we can talk about okay. that in a bit. But you've mentioned something really useful, which is if it's something you're considering and you're thinking, maybe these symptoms could be related to my hormones. There is some really good information online. And actually, you can get a symptom tracker or a symptom checklist with a whole list of symptoms in it. And there's some brilliant online places like Harley Street at Home, which is a Facebook group that both you and I contribute yeah. to and, and give expert advice to. And, and it's on free. there, and it's free. <laughs> Yeah, but on there, there are some really good resources. And if you just click in, there is a, a menopause checklist on there. And even if you just Google menopause checklist, you will find some really good, um, some good kind of tables that will take you through the common symptoms of menopause. There are about 30 and it, it, it can be helpful to look at it and go through it and think, actually, are, are the collection of things I'm experiencing on this list? And it can really help to understand that it may be due to your hormones. Sure. OK, right. So we can do a lot of work ourselves to yeah. understand what's going on. Yeah. Quick thought as well. If you've got older sisters or, mm. you're, you're, you know, you're in touch with your mum, mm. is it worth asking them about their experience? Are you likely mm. to have a similar experience to siblings or, or your mum? Mm. Yeah, you can have a similar. It's not 100 percent. So you won't okay. definitely have the same age or the same experience. It is more closely related to your sister than your mum, actually. And I suppose your mum, you've got 50% of your mum's genes. So yeah. you're going to follow some of that genetic pathway. But your sister has got some of your genes too. And they've had been in the same environment as you. And environment yeah. also affects menopause. So you're more likely to follow your sister than your mother. But they both can give you some good information, you know. And, and some people follow it very, very similarly. OK, right. That's useful to know then. Um, mm. And right. Again. So now mm. we've done our checklist. Now mm. we reckon I mm. think this is perimenopause. Yes. yes. Um, do we need to wait until those periods stop till menopause before we can get any help? What, what do we do next? Absolutely not. So there are a huge range of things you can do in the perimenopause to help your symptoms. And I think um, you mentioned about blood tests. So, you know, often we think, well, there must be a blood test to tell me where I am in this hormone yeah. journey. But actually, we love a test, don't we? I know, because we, can, we know, want proof. Yeah. We think, is it really my hormones? Is it something else? Now, um, over the age of 45, you do not need a test to diagnose the menopause. And in fact, they are totally unhelpful. And it's because of this huge variation in hormones that we have at that age. So you can do a test in the morning, it's high, do a test in the evening, it's low. So it becomes irrelevant. And so actually the nice suppose, guidelines say you sorry. shouldn't do it. Yeah. No, I was going to say, so I suppose that's also why symptoms change so dramatically exactly. because it's all affected by this roller coaster of those hormones and as you say if you you know if, if they're really low in the morning you could be re feeling wretched and then mm. by the afternoon things pick up and you start feeling a bit more like yourself again which mm. I guess also is why some women try and just grin and bear it because it's not mm. constant yeah. really gosh it's it's tough isn't it I know it is and that happens a lot so in the perimenopause it's not a, a continuous set of symptoms often you will have a period of anxiety for a few months even and then you're okay for a bit maybe you have some poor sleep maybe you get some itchy skin things don't always stay around because of this hormonal variation okay. it's interesting as well like a lot of women that i see in clinic say to me oh you know i've had these things but none of them have been that bad you know none of them have meant i couldn't work or none of them meant... but they're still really affected and i think it's so important to say 
you still, you know, deserve to have advice and help yeah. and, and thinking about these symptoms, even if they're not, you know, so severe that you're in bed all day. I yeah. think the idea that women feel that they have to struggle with really, you know, anxiety or they, you know, they, they lose their confidence or they, they can't think straight, they get brain yeah. fog. Yeah. And the thought they have to just cope until something gets absolutely awful is something that I see a lot. And I really want to say, you know, if you think you're getting symptoms and it is affecting your life, it doesn't have to be completely awfully severe, dr severe drenching sweats and your period stop. Try and seek help because actually yeah. there's so much that you can do. Oh, here, here. I tell you what, I mean, I, I'm really lucky in that, um, A, I'm not going to have a menopause, but uh, the, men, the women that I work with generally yeah. have registered that's what's going on. Yeah. And they've started to look at where they're going to, how they're going to take control of things. Mm. And the one thing I'm always th really inspired by is, you know, we're, we're sort of painting all the picture of the, of the bad side of it. Mm. But the reality is, of course, that actually this can be a magic time of mm. your life because mm. for once and I think you know I, I lose track of how often I see this that a woman has kind of if she's been you know um, a partner had a career but has a career running a house looking after kids looking out for elderly parents she's often kind of fallen to the bottom of the heap in yeah. terms of priorities and actually this can be a moment to stop and think, wait a minute, you know, uh, uh, what about me? And, and yeah. start to prioritise your own needs a little bit. And I guess that idea of, you know, of, of menopause is actually a moment to reevaluate how you want life mm -hmm. to be. So whilst, yes, I think the one thing I would certainly say is, whilst you're in ignorance, and unaware of what's happening, it is pretty miserable. Yeah. As soon as you actually register, right, that's what it is. I'm not yeah. losing my mind and I'm going to take control of the situation. It suddenly becomes really quite, um, quite an amazing phase of your life. You're so right. And this is why it's so important to get this kind of conversation and education out there. Let's talk about it more. Let's make sure people know what's happening to them, because it's partly the not knowing that makes things hard. As yeah. soon as you know, it can be, you know, there's things you can do. And also, like you say, the lack of conversation about the menopause to make people feel it's a kind of negative time of life. People can feel invisible. And even if actually, if you Google images, menopause, you find women with kind of fans stuck to them and, and it looks oh, awful. You know, yeah. we, we totally need to rebrand it because it isn't that. It is a, to it's a time of life where, like you say, you can really start to think about yourself, your health, you know, potentially, a some fewer responsibilities coming up with kids or you know other yeah. other things and it, it, it can be an amazing time of life but it's the lack of no knowledge and the kind of cultural negativity that people think they're walking into some kind of negative phase of aging and it really yeah. really doesn't have to be like that um well, and I think again the physical changes can make people feel bad about themselves you know you will know that it's a time when people can really gain weight and shift weight and mm. it can ch make people's self-esteem low and change their whole concept of themselves so you know I, you must see that a lot in what you know in what you do Nigel hugely and you know the reality of course is that most women that walk through the door to see me that is the driver is the fact mm. that they have gained this middle mid um trunk weight um, mm. and of course from my point of view where estrogen is getting involved here is the fact that you know it's the hormone that gives women their female shape that yeah. traditional sort of hourglass even if you you've been on the heavy side you still probably have a slightly nipped in waist that's estrogen that has done that and when you start losing your estrogen, the way you lay down your fat begins to change and you'll start to feel it. 
sort of you end up laying back down like a bloke, essentially, around this central area, around the back, around, um, you know, the, 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 you know, sort of get that spare tire, muffin mm. tops. Women will often say to me, you know, I used to have a shape and now I'm just a box on legs, you know? And um, the, so I think it's really important to know that mm. actually, that's about estrogen, but there's mm. another thing that's going on as well for you. And again, this kind of emphasizes the point that as a species, if you just think of us as a species of life, mm. you know, we were never meant to live as long as we do now. We were never meant to live into our 80s yeah. and 90s. Yeah. And we start aging from about 30, 35. You know, we lose our bone density. We start losing muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. And that's so important because that muscle tissue is the tissue that controls your metabolic rate. The yeah. rate, the, the efficiency of the way you, you use up calories, just in the same way that you, your car would have, a, you know, the efficiency it uses fuel up. So your, meta, your metabolism, your metabolic rate begins to slow down very gently mm -hmm. year on year. That's happening to men and women, but mm. when women start losing estrogen, the mm. rate at which that muscle tissue is lost begins to speed up a little bit. Yes. So you're actually going to be the exception to the rule if you don't gain weight at perimenopause. Yes. We Isn't reckon 75% mm. of women will gain mm. on average 10 kilos over that period of the perimenopause. So that's about yeah. a kilo and a half, two kilos a year for most women. Yeah. And it's often that point then when a woman will come and she'll say, you know, I don't get it. Nothing has changed, mm -hmm. you know, but here I am now at 45. I've got this wardrobe. 50, I can't get anything on. Nothing fits anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what's happening. And I've tried every diet. Yeah. And of course, every diet that you might have done when you were 30 um, isn't going to work anymore because this is now a totally different body mm. that's deficient in estrogen, mm. that is losing muscle tissue. Yeah. But I have to say, a bit like, you know, how specialist you are as a GP, as a dietitian, I have worked in this field for the last mm. 20, 25 years. Mm. And I promise you, ladies, you can take control of this and you mm. can get that figure back. You can get the weight off. And the beauty is you do not have to do any kind of crazy, fad, silly diet. You, in fact, you mustn't. You know, we have got to take care of your bone health, yeah. and your heart health at this mm. time. Yeah. And actually, what we need is a lifestyle plan yeah. that's going to be lifelong, that mm -hmm. just becomes the way you live for the rest of your life. So together, yeah. you know, it, the, the beauty is when you get the combination. So you, you sort it out with a doctor like Zoe and really begin to feel yourself again. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come on in a second to what, what that can mean. <clears throat> Once you're feeling mm. back in the driving seat, back in the room, then I can work with you and we yeah. can really start to take control <coughs> of the weight. But I would really say, excuse me, I would really say, I think I've got a bit of passion stuck in my yes, throat there. Yes. <laughs> you know? yeah. but you can't, you cannot get your weight sorted out until mm. you are feeling good. Yeah, You've got to yeah. be on your A game and you deserve yeah. to be, you know, yeah. the days have gone for ladies yeah. to get a touch of the vapours and go off into yeah. a dark room and come out mm -hmm. when this is all over. You know, mm -hmm. there is a lot of life to be living right now. Yeah. And, you know, that is exactly why it. you and I are so passionate about educating people in this area because just like you've said is once you know how to look at the weight changes differently and once you know that yes you know getting older changes your metabolism but wowzers loss of estrogen accelerates that loss of muscle mass and this is where we are once you know that you need a different approach 
there is so much that you can do. And it's exactly the same, you know, looking at the other symptoms. Once you know, there's so much that you can do. Um, and, and, you know, it's all about that. And again, you know, it's people that I see often in clinic will often say, um, will HRT cause weight gain? Because, um, you know, that's something yeah. that I've been struggling with. And we'll talk about that next week, I know, but the answer is no. Um, but... And then they often say, oh, I'm so sorry, that sounds so vain. And I think, absolutely not. This is how you feel about yourself. This isn't vanity. This is about our lives, our confidence, our self-esteem, you know. And that is what we need people to feel completely comfortable about wanting to feel good. And, you know, being educated about how to do that. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I often think, you know, what has happened to you if you don't care about that yeah. where has your self-esteem gone yeah. um and i mean there's something wonderful about women in their 40s i think by this stage you know you know what you're going to be prepared to put up with you're not going to take any caca off anybody mm. you you know you know who you are mm. um and usually you know maybe um, you've kind of done a lot of the things that you set out to do when you were 20. You've got kids, you've done well in your, you know, in your hobbies or your career. You've probably, you know, you've either settled and are enjoying life with your partner or you've got rid of him if he was no good. Maybe, you know, you're not as worried financially as you were. And, and as you say, you know, you sort of start thinking, this is what life, now I'm beginning to feel like a grown and then all of a sudden menopause comes like a blinking great heavy shovel and smacks you on the back of the head yeah. um, and it's not you know it's not fair but I think what's also not fair is our society does not think it's okay for women to age yeah particularly women you know and in the same way that we were mm. maybe 10 years ago mm. you know when really people with mental health problems were were mad or had to have a crisis or mm. had to have a breakdown and the reality is mm. all of us have got mental health issues mm. you know all of us struggle mm. at yeah. dealing with life on life's terms and we are beginning now I think to see that mental health is exactly the same as physical fitness you yeah. just have to see where you are on that that range yeah. and that's where we've got to get to with menopause mm. Mm. You know? absolutely and yeah and this idea like you say that aging and menopause have to be negative it has to absolutely change and i think i hope that people if they're listening to this live or you know or later um, hopefully if you have any of these symptoms this will help you to recognize them and think know that you can do something about them but even if you don't you will know looking ahead what might happen and it isn't bad it isn't yeah. bad it's just something to know about like puberty puberty has its challenges you know it's a phase of life to know about and once you know there's so much that you can do and it can be so positive absolutely and i think you know um people are assuming that the only thing you could do is maybe is HRT. And I think what we want to make sure that people understand is that we're all about choice. Yeah. And HRT isn't the right choice for everybody. No, um, but absolutely, it can be a very, very safe choice and yeah. bring an awful lot of health benefit with yes. it, apart yeah. from just symptom relief yeah yeah absolutely it's all about choice and we've struggled in recent years with people knowing hrt can be a good choice and can be a safe choice and can help with their future health but it certainly isn't the only part of the conversation the conversation yeah. is huge you know and what you can do is completely up to you but it's just important to have that information and the correct information and I think also, I mean, in, even in the, the time that I've worked in menopause, HRT itself is a very different uh, world to the mm. one it was a few years ago. You know, we've got so many different types. It has mm. been tweaked. I mean, goodness me, we will, I know, next week talk about those you know the crazy studies the crazy yeah. daily mail headlines mm. that are mm. still stuck on mm. 
many GPs radar let alone you know yeah. women's radars mm. but you know we used to make HRT from horses urine yes. now we make it from plant products mm. it's a, you know such mm. a natural product yeah. um, that I think you know it's important that we kind of pull it apart and put it back together again and, yeah. and also let women know just about the choice in the mm. forms you can take it in yeah. Um, yeah. And, and how it works. Um, in terms of um, the sorts of women that come to you for help I, I mean, my understanding is that the majority, not all, but the majority of menopause specialist doctors tend to see people privately. There mm -hmm. is, uh, it's quite difficult to get to see a menopause specialist on the NHS, I think. Yeah. And an awful lot of what were menopause clinics have, have, um, have gone now. There are very few. There is a list available online, but there are very few NHS specialist clinics and it's something we're campaigning for all the time actually um, but there are very few and people are, you know it, it, people are quite lucky if they end up seeing a menopause specialist on the NHS because yeah. they are so few and far between even if you get referred sometimes it gets bounced back and you know there's all sorts of problems with it so like you say there are a number of, of menopause specialists that can't work in the NHS that do work privately. Sure. Mm. But again, I think, you know, um, I often, because I, I do a lot of work with mm. over in Ireland yeah. um, or in the yeah. States yeah. and where people are, and even just thinking more recently with um, ladies in Australia mm. and there, you know, we're in a very different health system. And I think mm. it's important to remember that, you know, amazingly still with health insurance and things like that, mm. you can rarely get menopause care under your health insurance. So it's yeah. of, this is often something that someone's going to have to self-fund mm. um, to get that, that right sort of help. But I think, again, what I would like people to know is that if you choose to do something like this, to, to, to see a menopause doctor, you don't lose your GP. Oh, no, this is also no, yeah. something that you don't have to keep coming for like 10 appointments. You no. probably come for one. Yeah. Um, you probably have a follow up in about three months. And yeah. if things are good after that, mm. you do it once a year. It's like getting a good pair of glasses yes. you know, in terms yes. of the investment. Yes. This isn't going to cost you thousands. No, but, no. Um, you know, but actually... I think, you know, we're not in that culture where we sort of think that we, you know, we deserve or we, yeah. private healthcare is for somebody else. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we do need to sort of say now, um, you know, just like most of us pay for our dental care or mm -hmm. for our optical care for that matter, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not right. Yeah. But that is how it is. Yeah, um, I think it again, it, the opportunity that you have got in a specialist clinic. So me and my colleagues at Menopause Care, we have a long time with each patient. So not only have we got that specialist knowledge, so we will be able to give people, you know, the correct information, the correct advice, the, the best options. Um, we also have time and time because it, it, it's private. It is so important in menopause care because it takes a long time to find out from someone their experience their journey yeah. what's going on their health their history you know what they want out of life their family history all of these things you have to explore in my opinion to give the best menopause advice and in the nhs wherever you are seeing it is very limited time is very limited so i think there is an advantage with having time um and you know i hope that for women that i see it is a good investment you know because hopefully they will be set up for a long time of feeling well into this phase of life but yes i know it is it's difficult it's a, a different way of doing things isn't it well, well it is and and i mean i was worked in the nhs myself for a time i've worked mm. privately now for a long long time mm. and exactly as you say that was my reason mm. you know with dietetics, um, you are really pulling someone's lifestyle apart. You're mm. pulling apart their relationship with food, mm. their beliefs about food, their their whole 
self-esteem i suppose why mm. if particularly if it's around weight control and then you're going to put that back together again in a very personalized plan you know mm. this isn't kind of uh printed out diet sheets this is yeah. creating a plan for somebody mm. i allow an hour for for that first appointment um and lots of follow-up and support along mm. that way as well and i you know i think there are treatments and and periods in life where exactly as you say this can't be done in a five or ten minute quick it is very hard so i'm i still work in the nhs as a gp and i have 10 minutes for an appointment and for and you know i you know it's my passion menopause is my passion so i often see women you know a majority of my appointments tend to be women in the menopause mm. um but i do have 10 minutes and i I have various tricks of the trade and I often send a lot of information out separately. And, you know, I, I, I have various ways of doing it, but it's really hard to do what we need in the menopause, which is, and the nice guidelines say this, individualized care you know it is completely individual one size will not fit all in the menopause and that is what's difficult to do in those very short time slots yeah oh, oh yeah 100 percent. and of course it's also i'm going to do a little bit of a plug now but this is why we set up harley street mm. at home so mm. we are a facebook group mm. we are completely free of charge and dr zoe um, Dr. Naomi Potter, Dr. Corinne, Dr. Liz are all with us, as well as um, experts in different types of exercise like yoga, Pilates, mm. um, experts in coaching and mm. mindfulness and reframing your thinking. We've brought together a whole group of menopause specialists who have provided really the toolkits that you could mm. need um, so that you can build this yourself. We know not everybody can come for private consultations and that's why Harley Street at Home is there. Yeah. So as, the, as, as um, uh, Zoe mentioned, you know, you can go on there and you can, you can, it's, uh, you just, answer a couple of questions to join then you can access your menopause symptom check if you do want to go and actually try your gp first and mm -hmm. see if they've got any knowledge mm -hmm. um our doctors have produced a brilliant um video to help you prepare for going to see your doctor somebody actually mm -hmm. messaged me just this morning from new zealand to say that she took that uh video watched it and she walked into her gps in new zealand and said good morning i would like hrt please i'd like the spray not yeah. the patch or the pump i'd like the spray and she left with exactly what she went in and asked for yeah, fantastic um, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and great. on the site it's absolutely wonderful because i mean it's an amazing group but again the women educate and support each other about their experiences yeah. which is so important i think you know some of the women on there are incredibly expert as well now because we share so much good information and we check that the information is correct so you know there are we are the experts on there and you know in the team of experts we check that what is being shared is is correct and, and good information and it, it really is very empowering it is and, and mm -hmm. i mean it's an amazing thing to think that really harley street at home was born out of lockdown you know mm -hmm. there was just literally time on our hands and thinking right actually what could we do and let's just see if there's any interest mm. in this and here we are mm. now we've got over eight thousand members yes. um it just grows every day um mm. so yeah be fab if um you know if you if you want more help and if you want to keep that dialogue going and keep your um information source going it's mm. all there for you um so Looking at then what we're going to put into this this short series, I mean, literally, we could be doing this for months, but we've got three more sessions. Yes. Um, so next week, we're going to cover HRT. Yes. Um, and I, I mean, I think that's going to be great for women who, who just want to actually get up to date and mm. get the facts about yes. HRT. So we, can we do some myth busting? Absolutely. Yes. Great idea. There are so many myths, aren't they? So yes. let's, yes, let's do it. Let's talk about the facts. Let's bust some myths about HRT. Fab. 
Um, and also, I think, you know, some women who are maybe on HRT already um, or might know a little bit about it will, you know, will want to know about things like, well, will you take oestrogen? Will you take progesterone? Mm -hmm. Why do some women take testosterone? So perhaps yeah. we can explore that a little I bit. I was thinking we hadn't even mentioned testosterone this evening. And so we've definitely got to cover that because it's a big topic. And again, n there's not much good information out there. So we need to do that. Okie doke. Fantastic. Then we're going to look at sleep. And that's really your yes. area of specialty. And I, yes. I know what you and I have I've done a chat on Harley Street at home on there and I loved yeah. it. And I think again, um, you know, it was amazing. If you are struggling to sleep, ladies, join us in two weeks because then um, Dr. Zoe's approach, I assumed a lot of it was going to be about prescriptions and drugs mm. to help. Mm. And none of it is. Really. <laughs> no. It's very, no. very yeah. um, I suppose it's quite a lot of common sense, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But it's actually it's about what you. works. And I tell you what, it's usually not in the medicine that works yeah. with sleep. You have to look at it differently. Um, but I agree. Yeah, but there's hopefully some really good tips because it's such a common problem for people yeah. in the menopause. But also, even if you're not, poor sleep, you know, there's, yeah, it's, it's a big problem. one dodgy night sleep and I am re truly struggling to function yeah. the next day yeah. how women are coping with three or four nights of sleep uh, nights mm. uh, hours of sleep a, a night for mm. months and months I have no idea I mean it's like having a new baby again yeah. Um, yeah. just horrendous and then final week is we are going to um, pull menopause weight management apart yeah and absolutely blow the lid off what you need to do so i really hope folk will join us and of course we will i will remember to record so you can watch mm -hmm. on catch up um zoe i love doing these chats um, me too thank great. you so much if anyone has any questions for us the things they want us to cover you can leave comments below this when it's saved on we are fit and well so um that would be great thank you Nigel. it's been fab you go and have a lovely evening. I know you've had a manically busy day. And <laughs> yeah, I yeah. bet you're shattered. Um, and for everybody watching, thanks so much for, for joining us. And as Zoe said, questions for next week or other things you want us to talk about, just leave them in comments and we will pick them up and um, be only too happy to help if we can. But for this yeah. evening, thank you. Thanks a million. And thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Bye. See you.